John, thank you, and thank you, everyone else, for coming. It's wonderful to be back in, in this beautiful city and um, on such a beautiful day. I'm hoping the, the, the day will actually not remain quite so beautiful because I want you to be able to see my slides in full Technicolor qualia, which uh, we'll be talking about. Um, it's a great honor to be invited to give these lectures, I think particularly for a psychologist, not even really a cognitive psychologist. Um, I've done a lot of things in my life, but um, one thing I've never been is a philosopher. Um, it's, uh, my talk will be somewhat different from the last few series of Puffendorf lectures. I checked up online to see what kind of thing you were used to, and um, I thought, well, I can't do that. I can't read you a paper of that kind, though I do have text of my, of my talks. Um, these are going to be lectures. Uh, they're not going to be. I, I hope you wouldn't get the same from reading them in a book. Um, and I hope uh, the visual element will actually be an important part of, of your experience. Um, I think that's the point of giving live lectures, that they don't just get the words. It's an interesting experience to be in this room, which is clearly divided into two hemispheres. <laughs> uh, uh, I'll be talking, of course, to the left hemisphere, but I hope the right hemisphere will be appreciating the, the emotional content of, of of what I say, and but perhaps the corpus callosum somewhere in there will <laughs> link these two, these two, these two phenomena. Um, just to introduce what I'm going to do, I, I, I consulted Peter Johansson, my good friend, about what he thought I should present here. I, um, he said, well, you know, you've been invited because you've done a lot of different things, so I thought I'd talk about a lot of different things. And my four lectures are going to be on separate subjects. The first one, um, as Bjorn said, it will be about consciousness, which has been really the love of, of my life for the last 50 years. Um, I'm also going to talk, and tomorrow I'm going to talk about evolutionary medicine. On Wednesday, no, it's, that's, that's Tuesday, Thursday, isn't it? I'll talk about um, aesthetics. And on, and on Friday, some, uh, some more political ideas, because I thought I ought to at least uh, go into some of the other of my semi uh, philosophical interests, I should say, in the nature of human rights and so on. So, but let me, let me get to work on this first lecture, um, Soul Dust, as it is the title of my new book. Um, what I'm going to be talking to you about is about the magical qualities of consciousness, about how consciousness lights up the world for us and makes us feel special and transcendent, how indeed it creates the idea of the human soul, and even if we get to it, of the immortal human soul. But I'm not going to go straight there. Um, I want to start out with some rather more elementary remarks about the nature of conscious sensation, because if we don't know where we're beginning on this, we can't get to the more elevated areas I want to talk about. I want to talk about what it feels like to be a conscious creature living in the present, to what it feels like to have your hair pulled or to roast your nose in front of the fire or to run through the wet salt waves. And in fact, I want to start by telling you about a quite new theory of what sensation amounts to. It's, I should be clear about the words here. Sensation is the way we represent our interaction with the stimuli at the surface of our bodies. The touch of, uh, on our skin, or the light at our eyes, or the pressure at our ears. Um, sensation is not the same thing as perception. Perception is the way we represent the world out there, the waves as such, or, or the fire as such. But sensation is something much more personal. It's the way we represent what's happening to me and how I, as a subject, evaluate it. The pain is in my toe, and it's horrible. The sweet taste is in my tongue, and it's sickly. The red light is in front of my eyes, and it's stirring me up. It's as if, in having sensations, we're both registering the objective fact of stimulation and expressing our personal bodily opinion about it. And indeed, as we'll see shortly, I think we are doing <coughs> something just like that, expressing our personal bodily opinion. But it's the way we do it which is so surprising. What we represent this bodily opinion as. Where, where do those extra dimensions, those qualitative dimensions, come from? What can make the subjective present seem so rich and deep, as if we're living in what I've called thick time, in the thick moment of consciousness. What can Kandinsky mean when he writes, color is a power which directly influences the soul. Color is the keyboard, the eyes are the hammers, the soul is the piano with many strings. 
Why indeed do we say, at least in English, it's like something to be conscious? Why do we say it is something to be conscious? Is it because what it's like is actually, actually something, it's like something which it actually really couldn't be? Well, I'll come to that. And in asking these questions, we're up against what I'm sure you all know as the hard problem of consciousness. And I don't need to tell you that it's a problem that some of our best philosophers and scientists too, um, they've said that we're never going to be able to solve it. The philosopher Jerry Fodor tells us so almost every week. Um, here's a typical remark. Uh, we can't, as things stand now, so much as imagine the solution of the hard problem. The revisions of our concepts and theories that imagining a solution will eventually require are likely to be very deep and very unsettling. There's hardly anything that we may not have to cut loose from before the hard problem is through with us. <coughs> well, Fodor's right, of course, that we haven't been doing too well in imagining a solution. And he's right that the problem can indeed sometimes seem impossibly hard. But I think we should put the emphasis on that word seem, because for something to seem to have mysterious, inexplicable qualities, that doesn't mean it really has them. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by a well-known example. <coughs> Suppose we were to come across an object, a real physical object made of wood, let's say, lying on a bench that looks just like this, like the impossible triangle, so-called. Well, it would seem for sure to be a physical impossibility. But that doesn't mean we should throw away our physics books and cut loose from everything we know. We'd soon realise, of course, that it must be some kind of illusion. And sure enough, if we could only change our viewpoint, we'd discover that uh, we discover that what we're actually looking at is the strange object shown here, an object carefully constructed to deceive us when we see it from one particular fixed position. As Sherlock Holmes said, once you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, and that's certainly a pretty improbable object, that must be the truth. And indeed, I think the truth about consciousness if only we can see it from the right perspective, is that it is indeed a highly improbable bit of biological engineering, a clever trick played on us by nature, but one that really does have a relatively, relatively simple explanation. So where should we begin? What questions should we be asking? Well, Jerry Fodor has had more to say. Nobody, he writes, has the slightest idea what consciousness is, or what it's for, or how it does it, how it does what it's for, to say nothing of what it's made of. Well, whatever we may think about the nobody here, I think we can agree that uh, those do look like rather good questions. What phenomenal consciousness is, what it's for, how it does what it's for, and what it's made of. Um, and they're, in fact, the questions I'm going to use to structure my talk today, at least the first half. But I'm not going to give them equal weight, because what really excites me are some new ideas about the third of these, about what consciousness is for, uh, its evolutionary function. And that's going to be the most of the second half of my talk. So to start off with, what's, what is consciousness, phenomenal consciousness? What kind of thing is the sensation of red or the salt taste of an anchovy or the searing pain of a burn? Well, my answer is that it's a kind of magical recreation, a show that we lay on for ourselves inside our own heads. In response to stimulation of our sense organs, we create something, an extraordinary artwork, I don't uh, put that, use that word advisedly, an artwork for our minds to look at. It's a simulacrum of sorts, which does track the interaction of our body with the outside world, the sights and sounds and smells. And this means that in forming a mental representation of this object, we can indeed get a picture of what's happening to us. But the object we're creating does much more than merely track our interaction uh, in an objective sense. It steeps it in subjectivity. It adds a personal dimension. It colours it with, um, with emotion. And on top of all of that, it adds a mysterious, mysterious dimension of temporal depth. So that now, when we form a representation of it, we don't simply discover uh, what's happening. We get to have a picture that it's like to have, which is like something in the, in the sense which Tom Nagel introduced. <coughs> 
a picture that has indeed acquired some weird and rather wonderful properties, lifting us as subject, subjects of it into a new level of reality, or perhaps we should say now, of non-reality. All right, so I've drawn this as a theatre. How about this theatre? Many of you will know that, uh, that philosophers in recent years have mocked the idea of there being any such theatre in our theatre inside our heads, where the brain creates a simulacrum for another part of the brain to look at. Uh, Dan Dennett's led the field in criticising this, th this <coughs> idea. Uh, the persuasive imagery of the Cartesian theatre, he says, keeps coming back to haunt us, lay people and scientists alike, even after its ghostly dualism has been denounced and exorcised. Well, then it would be right, of course, to dismiss the idea that there's a place inside our heads where one part of our brain creates a replica, a faithful replica of the world for another part of the brain to look at. Because then, of course, you'd need another uh, part of the brain to look at that and so on <coughs> in, uh, in, in an infinite regress. But despite its entry into the philosophical literature, I think this use of the word theatre is entirely misleading. Replication is not what theatres are about, not real humanly created theatres. What r real theatres are, are about, what their places where events are staged in order to comment in one way or another on the world, to educate, to persuade, to entertain. So that's, uh, that's a picture of uh, Dennett's idea of the replica, and here's a, a theatre now. Um, uh, but that's what a real theatre is about, it's not creating a replica. Just look at this audience. Uh, clearly they're not there to see a replica, they're there for the added value that the theatrical drama provides. Now, of course, they wouldn't show this rapt attention if it were simply a replica. But suppose now that uh, rather than this being just a, a, sim uh, a simple replica, this egg was to have been magically transformed. Um, supposing it were to have been coated in batter and toasted, uh, and that amazingly it had come to resemble the Virgin Mary. Well, that would be something else entirely. Um, and as many of you probably know, this particular bit of French toast sold for $3,000 on eBay. <coughs> um, so now, in the case of consciousness, what I'm suggesting is that part of our brain is indeed staging a magical show in order to influence the judgment of another part of our brain, to sell the world for, to us, and indeed perhaps to sell it for more than it's really worth. Um, and what's that for, biologically? In what respect do conscious creatures lead better or more successful lives? Well, I'll be coming to that, but I'm going to put that off for the moment. But first, let's ask, uh, how does the spectacle of consciousness I've suggested is occurring, how does it get to have its spectacular qualities? How does it do what it's for, in Fodor's terms? If this indeed is what's on show, what can be going on backstage to create it? What strings are being pulled within the brain? Well, my answer is that it must indeed be some kind of, of illusion, a trick played on one part of the brain by another. And you'll see now, perhaps, why I've chosen this impossible construction to illustrate the idea of its being like something to be conscious. Because, as, as we've seen, it's quite possible to construct something that looks like this, like this, for real, or if not like this, it would be quite hard to construct out of wood, at least we saw that you can do it in that case. And indeed, let's watch it being done. You've probably seen this before. It's a very popular optical illusion called the Penrose Triangle, or Tri-Bar. But did you know you could make your own three-dimensional one? Let's get to work. Now, by placing the cut and folded paper on the floor, and placing your camera or your eye at just the right angle, you've made a Penrose Triangle. So, um, here's what we see, and what I'm suggesting is here what is, what is what we've made backstage to create the illusion. And I'm serious, I think this wonderful illusion-generating object provides just the kind of model we need for understanding consciousness. Here is something, a real physical object, that when seen from a possessed special position is, in the most literal sense, like something. Like something it actually can't be. Like this. <coughs> Magic, it seems. 
But still, as we've just seen, it's something that can be constructed by entirely mundane means. And if you can do that with paper and scissors, imagine what natural selection could have done with all the resources of the brain. But let's note, it's very important, that the crucial thing will be that we, as subjects of this experience, are seeing the thing we're creating from just that one very special point of view. Um, that's how it's going to look to us. Um, but that's objectively how it might seem from a third-person point of view. Um, and that means, by the way, I'm not going to talk much about neuroscience here, but I, I will point out that any scientist who goes looking in the brain for the neural correlate of consciousness, the NCC as it's come to be called, that scientist is going to have his work cut out because the problem will be that the scientist coming from the outside simply isn't going to recognize the neural correlate of consciousness for what it is, even if it's right in front of him. Observing this strange process in the brain, or the equivalent, uh, from the outside, but not knowing how to look at it, he's never going to guess that he's cracked the hard problem, and indeed that he probably ought to be getting the Nobel Prize. But I'm not going to sort of say more about the neuroscience. I'll leave it for, for any neuroscience and scientists and audience to question me about that. Um, I'm going to say something more though, about what it might be more formally at, uh, as a process in the brain, what it's actually made of, at least uh, mathematically. I suggest we should be starting, though, about what it's asked by asking what it's made from historically. Um, if this up down there is now the sensory magic show as we know it, then how did it start off uh, in evolution? And I think the answer is that, in fact, Sensations as we know them today have always been, throughout a very long history, a kind of performance, something we're laying on for ourselves in order to, for us to represent as something to ourselves. And I'm going to outline very briefly the evolutionary story as I see it, because I think it's important to, to have this background idea as in evolution. So let's imagine a primitive animal. Um, it's an animal I imagine floating around in the primeval ocean. Uh, and things are going to happen to it. It's not much of an animal, it's really just a bag of jelly, but it's got a membrane, it's got a skin. Um, and s things are happening to its skin, lights are arriving at it, pressure waves are pushing up against it, um, uh, chemicals are sticking to it, for example. And some of those things are going to be good for the animal, and some of them are going to be bad or indifferent for the animal. And so it's going to need to react to them differently, to that one with a whoopee, and to this one with an ouch, and to another one, let's say, with a don't, don't care. Um, now, these responses are going to be simple reflex behaviors. I've called them wriggles of, of, of rejection or acceptance. Um, the animal's re reacting unconsciously to one stimulus with the equivalent of a skull to another one with the equivalent of a welcoming smile. Now, in the beginning, these responses are, of course, mere responses. The animal is in no way mentally aware of the stimulus. However, suppose the animal were to actually to want to know what's happening to it, to form a mental representation of what's happening at the body surface. Well, a neat solution would, would be for it to monitor its own response, since its own behavior, its reflex behavior, potentially carries loads of information about the nature of the stimulus, wh what it is, where, it's, where it is, when it's happening, and what's more, what import it has for the animal's well-being. It just needs to see what it's doing in order to find out something about what the stimulus means to it. And so it, indeed I think it happened that these are primitive animals, our ancestors, in the course of evolution, discovered that they could indeed represent what's happening to them by monitoring what they themselves were doing about it. But things were never going to stay like that. Um, the time was bound to come in evolution when the original bodily responses were no longer appropriate. You don't want to go on reacting with exactly the same kind of emotional response for the rest of your evolutionary life. Um, the animal no longer wanted to engage in these particular forms of bodily expression. But it still did want to track the stimulation. It still wanted to know what was happening to, to it. So what to do? Well, my answer, I think, and the answer I think evolution found was that these responses should become internalized. But where they could still be monitored. So the animal um, uh, could still 
um, could, sort of, could, could represent what the stimulus was at its body surface. Uh, they became, the responses became, as I say, privatized. And to cut this short story short, the upshot is that when today we, we, modern human beings, experience sensory stimulation, we're still responding with something like the ancient action patterns handed down from our ancestors. But now, these action patterns, this expression has become a virtual, a virtual expression occurring at the level of a virtual body inside our heads. Now indeed, it is a kind of pantomime, something whose purpose is no longer to do anything about the stimulus, but only to tell us something about the stimulus. Let's take the case of red, for example, which is nothing like the red I would hope you might have seen if the, lights had gone, if the sun had gone down. Um, red light arrives at our eyes, let's say. Um, and the next thing, behind the scenes, I've shown it on the surface there, but this is behind the scenes, we make an affective response to it of some kind. Now, this is an ongoing response. Uh, I've shown it moving there, and I've uh, given it an active name. I'm going to call this response reading. This is an active response to the stimulus. Um, but where's the sensation in all of this? Well, the sensation is the way we monitor this active response at the level of introspection. To have the sensation is to find ourselves, feel ourselves doing this reading. And so you'll see sensation has always been theatre of a sort. Yet at the start, it won't, of course, have been magical theatre. There's no reason to think that the show in the, in the original days um, was going to have any special uh, phenomenal illusion-generating qualities. So then, what happened next? Uh, how did this become this? So that the sensation did indeed become phenomenal, conscious sensation. Well, having seen what the show evolved from, can we guess what it's made of? And I think, yes, we can. It is a guess, but I think the answer lies in the process of privatization I've just been describing. I've shown it here in a different form. Here is the original form. The response was being made actually at the body surface. Much later in evolution, it's simply become internalized. Um, and what that has done is to create the potential for feedback loops, reentrant feedback loops. And the thing about feedback loops is that when conditions are right, they can have extraordinarily interesting properties. In particular, to begin with, they can become self-sustaining. And this self-sustaining activity going around the loop can get to have some very remarkable properties. Suppose that each time the activity cycles around the circuit, then the transmission characteristics at this junction between input and output are modified by the activity the previous time around. Well, then the, the development of the activity in that, in that cycle is going to be described by what mathematicians call a delay differential equation. And that means that typically the activity will either develop chaotically, which it wouldn't be interesting, or else it will settle into a, a so-called attractor state in which the same pattern repeats itself in a highly complex way, but repeats itself indefinitely. This film clip I'm just going to show you shows such a developing pattern in a feedback loop. Well, that's an example of a, of a simple attractor in, in three dimensions. Um, and here's another one. But often the attractor, which develops out of these loops, will turn out to be very much more complicated than that and will occupy a higher dimensional landscape. And the number of additional dimensions that would be needed to describe it can be very large indeed. In fact, there will be cases where it requ would require a graph with an infinite number of dimensions to describe the stable activity in that feedback loop. But if we want the potential for magic, well, there, surely, we've got it. Suppose that natural selection in designing the sensory show had all those extra dimensions to play with. The mind boggles at the possibility for creating mathematical objects in the brain that, when monitored internally, could seem to have extraordinary out-of-this-world properties. Almost anything, of course, we'd want to 
want to suggest. But to be more specific, and I'd better show you something how it might actually work. If there's one thing which everyone who's thought about sensory consciousness has remarked on, it's, it's the peculiar temporal characteristics of the phenomenal experience. Imagine yourself looking at a cascading waterfall or listening to the song of a nightingale. Physical time is flowing linearly forward with no let up in the relentless uh, passage from one instant to the next. But that's not how you experience it at the level of sensation. Rather, level of sensation, the present moment, the now of sensation, seems to hang on a little, as if each instance of sensation is still there for you for a brief period after you create it, as if it happens for longer than it happens. So what could possibly be going on? What could give rise to this illusion? Of course, it has to be an illusion that the past is still present, as if you are living in that time I called thick time. Well, as it happens, there's an answer we can take right off the peg. The philosopher Douglas Hofstadter has pioneered the analysis of a special class of feedback loop he calls a strange loop. In Hofstadter's words, for someone observing the cycle of activity in such a strange loop, then in the series of stages... Sorry. In the series of stages that constitute the cycling round, there's a shift from one level of abstraction to another. And yet somehow the successive upward shifts turn out to give rise to a closed cycle. Despite one's sense of departing ever further from one's origin, one winds up to one's shock exactly where one had started out. Well, uh, what might look, that what would, it, would that be like for an observer? What if you did, in fact, have something like that behind the scenes? Well, if you want a visual spatial metaphor, you've already seen it flashing up on the screen, I think what it might be like would be this. It might be like climbing an endless staircase that always takes you back to the same place that you began, that you set off from. Or if you want an auditory metaphor, it might be like listening to a glissando where the sound always seems to be rising in pitch without actually ever getting there. Uh, listen to this. <laughs> I'm playing that to you to persuade you what's really happening there. The sound isn't changing. Um, that seems to be going up and up and up. So that's an, an, a metaphor. I mean, I mean that's an analogy, of course. Um, but how might thick time arise from this? Well, let's look at it this way. If you climb that staircase and end up where you began, um, then we conventionally say that you've actually climbed, no, made, made no upward progress in height, you've climbed no distance. But space and time are equivalent in this uh, rather peculiar situation. So that if, it, that if you climb the staircase and end up exactly where you set out from earlier, an equally good interpretation would be that you've passed no time. Indeed, imagine you measured time by counting your steps upwards. So you start there, uh, one second, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds, so on. 12 seconds, 13 seconds, 14 seconds, no seconds. You're back where you, you started off earlier. You'd have spent time without actually using it. Um, and uh, to translate that back to sensation, suppose that in responding to the sensory stimulus, you were to initiate activity in a feedback loop whose attractor turned out to be just such a strange mathematical strange loop. Then when you monitored yourself doing it internally, and re represented that as sensation, would you indeed find yourself living in something like that thick moment, a moment which seems to catch its own tail um, and where you could spend time without actually losing it up? Well, of course, I don't know, and no one, it's hard to translate that directly into cognitive science at the moment, but I, I dare say that you might. I think you would have uh, come into a state where you were uh, the subject is representing sensation as if it lasts in its own virtual time. Of course, those ideas do need a lot more work, and I won't begin to claim that we've cracked the hard problem yet, but I will claim that cracks are a beginning, are beginning to appear in it. We've begun to see how 
what kind of solution could possibly work. It's not beginning to seem quite as unbelievably difficult as, as Jerry Fodor made out, um, but maybe we can discuss that um, as we go on. It's en enough for now about what consciousness is made of. I want to get on to what consciousness might possibly be for, this kind of consciousness. We've plotted a route from a primitive amoeba, amoeba to somebody living in the thick moment of sensation. But why did natural selection take that route? Uh, whatever uh, was the advantage in moving up that scale? Well, I think that philosophers and scientists who've asked this question have routinely missed the point because they've had completely the wrong expectations about what consciousness is doing. They've expected consciousness to be playing some kind of practical role in intelligence or in cognition. Um, and then they've been puzzled because it doesn't seem to. Here's Jerry Fodor again, it's always good for a quote. Consciousness seems to be among the chronically unemployed. What mental process can be performed only because the mind is conscious? And what does consciousness contribute to their performance? Why then, he says, did God bother to make consciousness? Well, of course he's asking the right question. Why did God bother, or let we should probably say, why did natural selection bother? But you'll see that he's assumed that consciousness must be providing us with some kind of new skill. It's helping us, to, as he believes, to achieve something, some outcome, that we can achieve only because we're conscious. Like, say, a bird can fly only because it's got wings, or you can understand this last sentence of mine, only because you know English. But as I've hinted already, I don't think the role of consciousness is like that at all. Let me say it again. Consciousness is theatre. Its job is to change our outlook on life, to give us a new view of just who and what we are and what kind of world we live in, not to give us a skill. Well, how can it be changing this, our worldview in these ways? There's obviously too much to discuss in half an hour, and there's a lot more in my book about this. But let me give you a taste of how I think it works, in human beings at least. So, we can start at a very simple level, just how it might contribute to joie de vivre. <coughs> in the process of becoming and remaining conscious, I want to say, in the simple pleasure of being there, we discover a new purpose in our own existence. As Lord Byron wrote, the great object of life is sensation, to feel that we exist even though in pain. Or as the, the philosopher Tom Nagel has put it more soberly, there are elements which, if added to one's experience, make life better. There are other <coughs> elements which, if added to one's experience, make life worse. But what remains when these are set aside is not merely neutral, it's emphatically positive. The additional positive weight is supplied by experience itself rather than by any of its contents. Well, I think the word sensualism approaches but hardly does justice to this emotion. Maybe we need the word presentism. At any rate, the emotion is a basic and familiar one. The yen to confirm and extend and renew in small ways or large our occupancy of the subjective moment. Uh, here's Many, find many examples here. Here's John Keats in a letter to a friend sharing his mouth with us and what, what he was experiencing. Talking of pleasure, this moment I'm writing with one hand and with the other holding to my mouth a nectarine. Good God, how fine. It went down soft, pulpy, slushy, oozy, all its delicious plumpness melted down my throat like a large beatified strawberry. Or here on a more heroic scale is Albert Camus uh, glorying in uh, luxuriating on the Mediterranean coast to Passa. How many hours, he writes, have I spent crushing absinthe leaves, caressing ruins, trying to match my breathing with the world's tumultuous sighs? Deep among wild scents and concerts of somnolent insects, I open my eyes and heart to the unbearable grandeur of this heat-soaked sky. Well, we see this kind of delight simply in being there, in animals as well, of course, and Again, I could give you many examples, but here's one uh, from Mark Beckoff. I once saw a young elk run across a snowfield, jump in the air and twist his body while in flight, stop, catch his breath and do it again and again. Buffalo have been seen playfully running onto and sliding across the ice, excitedly bellowing as they do so. 
Now, if it were us, it would certainly be the sense of its being like something, consciously like something, to slide across the ice that would be providing the incentive for human beings. And who can doubt that it's actually the same for at least some other animals? Um, these bonobos are surely enjoying simply being themselves. But then here's the question. Why should feeling we exist and valuing that feeling be biologically adaptive so that the underlying brain circuits would have been selected in the course of evolution? I think the answer, at least the beginning of an answer, is right there in front of us. It is that any creature that takes pleasure in the feeling of existence will develop a will to exist, and at least in humans, a will to live. Now, admittedly, you might think this has to be some kind of bootstrap operation, like rather like liking the sound of one's own voice. But why not, if it works? We accept that nature made sex pleasurable in order to encourage us to have more sex. Then why not make living magically delightful in order to encourage us to engage in life? And at least in humans, to increase our fear of death. As Philip Roth in an interview a few years ago wrote, I'm afraid of dying. I'm 72. What am I afraid of? Oblivion, of not being alive, quite simply of not feeling life, not smelling it. Roth is clearly contrasting oblivion with something else, um, something. And that something, I think, is provided by his sense of the theatrical space he occupies, living in the presence of sensations, feeling and smelling that thick moment of consciousness. For, of course, consciousness does more than simply, uh, simply bring delight. It gives us something substantive to hold on to, some thing to aim for, a ball to hold in the air. But that's only the start of it. Um, and let me move to the next level, at which I think being conscious dramatically changes people's outlook. And I'll call that enchanting the world. Now let's note that simple joie de vivre, the joy in feeling life or smelling it, can often be thoroughly introverted and self-centered, self-body-centered. It's the sensations in themselves that matter, the feels and the smells, and not the things in the world out there that give rise to them. And in fact, when basking in the present moment, we may choose deliberately to pull away from the world outside to enjoy sensations untroubled by reality. Matisse has taken a table laden with dessert and abstracted the pure forms. Bridget Riley, the abstract painter, has taken it still further. Um, this is a painting from an exhibition entitled appropriately, according to sensation. And in an interviewer interview, she says to someone sitting at a cafe table, no, don't think about what's out there. Just feel this moment at your eye. But, of course, at other times and in other moods, our delight in being conscious turns to being pointedly delight in living in this very particular world of things. Dutch painter De Heem, on whom Matisse based his painting, um, has created not just a feast for the eyes, but he's drawn attention to the glories of the world in itself as such. The solid existence of the glittering silver and gold goblets, the plump fruits, the smooth linen, the things as such. The English poet Rupert Brooke does it in verse in, in a very long poem. It runs for 150 lines, glorying in sensations. These I have loved, he writes, white plates and cups, clean gleaming, ringed with blue lines and feathery fairy dust, wet roofs beneath the lamplight, the strong crust of friendly bread and many tasting food, rainbows and the blue bitter smoke of wood, the benison of hot water, furs to touch, the good smell of old clothes and others such. The list is long. The poet fondles each commonplace sensory delicacy like a bead on a rosary. Each item produces in us, I think, a thrill of recognition. But whatever's going on here, why do such ordinary things seem so precious to a human being? Well, surely it's because some of the magic of our sensations is rubbing off on the things out there. So it seems to us as if the things out there in the world possess 
phenomenal qualities in their own right, as if the things as such have an extra dimension of presence. Now, of course, strictly speaking, this doesn't make sense. Um, it's the qualities of sensation are our creation. No way do they truly belong out there as properties of objects in the world. In the case of a red tomato, for example, um, it's a sensation of, of light at our eyes which has the phenomenal red qualities, not the tomato. The tomato is physically red. It's not phenomenally red. But here's the thing. All our experience has been that red tomatoes and red sensations go together. Salty anchovies and salty sensations go together. Cold water and cold sensations go together. So it's hardly surprising that the repeated association of the sensation with the perceived object that provides the stimulus is enough to give rise to the illusion that the sensation is actually a property of the object out there. So that the tomato itself seems to acquire phenomenal properties. Well, there's no question that when we project phenomenal qualities onto things in the world, we're making a philosophical mistake, a category mistake. But it doesn't matter. Philosophical quibbles are not going to stop us when the result is so enchanting. Literally, things are getting enchanted, and it's happening courtesy of our sensations. The connection becomes particularly obvious when sensation is intensified, as can happen, for example, with psychotropic drugs. Here's Aldous Huxley describing his experience with mescaline. The books with which my study wall were lined glowed with its brighter colours a profounder significance. Red books like rubies, emerald books, books in bound, bound in white jade, books of agate, of aquamarine, of yellow topaz. Well, um, this is, of course... Uh, an exaggerated mescaline experience. But I want to say that actually it happens all the time, that dull perceptual objects become magical for all of us. Ordinary things glow with brighter colours, profounder significance, and we don't need the drugs to make that happen. Indeed, borrowed phenomenality transforms the world into an awesome place, a place all the more amazing because of the intimate connection we feel we have to it, a place where the things out there seem to be singing our song, as indeed they are. How often have you looked into a, a fire or stared at a swirling pool and been knocked back by the sheer impossible beauty of it and your sense of union to it? And there's every reason to think that that's something too we share with our non-human, human relatives. Um, here's a remarkable piece of film of a chimpanzee. I looked at the stream completely mesmerized by the pattern of love flow through his fingers. I think, what, what's going through his mind? What, what, every day? What suddenly changed about it? The caption of, the, this, of a new book, it's called The Last Human, it reads, the play of light and shadow between trees, sun and sky fills this Neanderthal man with a sense of awe. Well, why not? Why shouldn't we speak of our Paleolithic ancestors as experiencing awe? And for that matter, chimpanzees as well. But then how does this attitude of awe affect survival? Well, I think we can say it certainly puts us in a frame of mind to count our blessings. It's not just good to be alive. Uh, but it's wonderful to be alive in this astonishing world. And here's Rupert Brooke again. Uh, in a flicker of sunlight on a blank wall or a reach of, sm of muddy pavement or smoke from an engine at night, there's a sudden significance and importance and inspiration that makes the breath stop. It's a feeling that has amazing results. I suppose my occupation is being in love with the universe. Well, if we want an adaptive function for consciousness, perhaps being in love with the universe will do. Uh, but more specifically, how can, what can we translate that into? Being in love. Being in love is a powerful emotion. It, it motivates us to engage with things, to investigate them, to make them, to go out and find them. The chimpanzee goes to the stream in order to 
played with the water and experiences yeah. sensations. But here's a different kind of example. The dolphin's blowing its own bubbles so as to relish the qualities which it itself is projecting onto its own creation. And, of course, humans are the same, only more so. Because we delight in the world, we ourselves have lit up with our own creativity. We've become creatures dedicated to play and to exploration, with the result that simply by indulging our love affair with things, we learn ever more about the true potential <coughs> of the world we live in. Another picture from the same book. A juvenile Australopithecus greets a new morning two and a half million years ago. And again, why not? It's the emotion of every child on a spring morning. Where am I going now? I don't quite know. Down to the stream where the king cups grow. Up on the hill where the pine trees blow. Anywhere, anywhere. I don't know. Where am I going? The high rocks call. It's awful fun to be born at all. Well, awful fun is not the half of it. The fact is that life in this world for conscious creatures can be unspeakably beautiful and interesting. I'm talking of children on a spring morning. I should show you this next bit of film I was recently sent. <laughs> And rather like in Brooks' poem, this, this young deer went on playing in the water um, uh, for line after line after line. Well, all right, I'd say that this increased interest in being in the world could alone be enough to translate, to explain the adaptive advantage of redesigning sensation to give us its phenomenal properties. At least in the first stages, this certainly happened long ago before human beings came on the scene. But for humans, there's also a payoff on a much grander level still. And I'll call that the level of the self and soul. We watch a sunrise, for example. Um, it's so amazing that, like the poet Blake, we may want to insist on its supernatural origin. He starts off sarcastically. When the sun rises, do you not see a round disk of fire, somewhat like a penny? Oh, no, no, he says, I see an innumerable company of the heavenly host crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. But another English mystic, Thomas Traherne, went straight to the paradoxical truth of this. By the very right of your senses, you enjoy the world. Doth not the glory of the sun pay tribute to your sight? When we watch that sunrise, the sun, as I said before, is singing our song. Oscar Wilde summed up the shocking but wonderful reality of this. It's in the brain that everything takes place. It's in the brain that the poppy is red, that the apple is odorous, that the skylark sings. And Francis Crick, a hundred years later, called this the, the astonishing hypothesis, uh, that you are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerves, nerve cells, and that everything is coming from your brain, from you. But um, I don't believe to many of us, or to most of us, when it comes to it, this really is so astonishing. At some level, we all already know it. Since we were children, we've all explored the wonders of subjectivity. Children are natural, natural born human philosophers. Back in the playground, we were all, all of us already asking the deep questions. For example, about our own peculiar role in generating the world of phenomenal colors. Could the light of the sun that I experience as subjective red be what you're experiencing as subjective blue in some sense? Um, but how could we even begin to ask those questions unless we'd already hit on that strange truth that all this glory really is down to us? I may say I've argued with uh, philosophers about whether children ask these questions. Uh, David Rosenthal maintained to me that, uh, of course, John Locke had invented this this question, the question of the inverted spectrum, and you couldn't even have begun to ask it until you'd done at least uh, part, part 1A philosophy. Um, but 
uh, I think it's most parents' experience that their children come to them asking those questions from the kindergarten onwards. Um, and I think it's full time philosophers caught up with, with the infants in some ways. Um, so it's we who are doing it. Um, and it means we should indeed take a high view of ourselves for being conscious. What am I doing here? What's it like to be me? What's it like to be the author behind the scenes of all this magical stuff? Well, what is it like? Well, one thing is it, it's like, it's like owning it. It's like it's being mine. Um, and Thomas Trahan had something to say about that. Thomas Trahan was actually much more radical in his fantasies than the prim Victorians uh, who made that first stained glass window imagined. Um, here's a new window recently created, which I think captures the man better. And here's what he wrote. The streets were mine. The temple was mine. The people were mine. Their clothes and gold and silver were mine. The skies were mine, and, the s and so were the sun and the moon and the stars, and all the world was mine, and I the only spectator and enjoyer of it. Well, of course, Drahan, like Huxley with his mescaline, is in a peculiar state of self-congratulation here, and mostly we're, we're more, more laid back about it. We're used to it. We take it for granted. But what we're taking for granted is a kind of miracle. And for humans, it shapes our sense of self. How does it do that? In many ways, I think. But I want to concentrate on one especially. What is the most psychologically salient property of conscious sensation? Well, surely it is just this. Trahan's obsession. That it belongs to me. To me alone. That I am indeed the sole spectator of it. Well, this idea that what we're doing is entirely logically private may indeed be an illusion. It's a consequence of the way it's getting set, it up, set up with our having just this one, this one privileged viewpoint on it. But psychologically, this privacy is hugely impressive, creating the irresistible idea of myself as a separate bubble of consciousness. And how does that affect people psychologically? Well, I'd say it encourages us to believe, as we never would do otherwise, in our own metaphysical importance that each individual human being is indeed a focal singularity within the universe. Now, you'll hear it said that there's no such thing as the self, um, that individualism is a recent invention, that no man is an island entire of himself. Yet I think the fact is that at the deepest level of personal experience, people discover the opposite. that when it comes to consciousness, every man is an island entire of himself. <coughs> now, I said that consciousness is, as theatre affects our outlook on life. Well, here's a big enough effect. But could this really be one of the ways that consciousness has been favoured by natural selection? Could there really have been any biological advantage to thinking of ourselves as being quite so special? Well, mine may be an unfashionable view, but yes, I think whatever the bad press from philosophers and ethicists, um, I've got no hesitation in saying that I believe that individualism, selfism, represents a real step up in the life game. Uh, and here, I'll quote William James, speaking long before political correctness might have stopped in saying it. Um, the altogether unique kind of interest which each human mind feels in those parts of creation, which they can call me or mine, may be a moral riddle, but it is a fundamental psychological fact. No mind can take the same interest in his neighbor's me as in his own. And if I think that the self-interest and the self-importance that follows from this is actually immensely empowering. As conscious creatures, we human beings have become naturally the kind of beings that aspire not only to be ourselves through continually affirming our presence in the world, but to make more of ourselves through learning and creativity and symbolic expression and spiritual growth and social influence and love of others too, and so on. And you may want to pick me up on what I've said about love of others because I've said consciousness separates and isolates us. And so indeed, indeed I think it does, that consciousness promotes individualism, and so it does. But that's not the end of the story. And what happens next makes up for all the narcissism. 
because the fact is that from, from soon after our first discovery of infant, as infants of the glories of being me, we humans are led to a daring speculation about the me's, about the selves of other people. If I myself have this astonishing phenomenon at the center of my existence, then isn't it likely, in fact even certain, that the same holds for other people? So what's that say then about the kind of creatures that we human beings collectively are? It's not just me. Every one of us is a creative hub of consciousness. All men have been created, have been endowed by the creator with an inalienable and inviolable mind space of their own, just as special, just as private, just as precious and important to them as mine is to me. Thomas Trahan delightedly expressed this side of things too. You never enjoy the world aright till you perceive yourself to be the sole heir of the whole world, and more than so, because men are in it who are every one sole heirs as well as you. Now, think about the paradox, but the remarkable insight of that last sentence, that everyone is a sole heir to the world as well as you. So I want to say that we are indeed a society of selves. Um, the idea is extraordinarily potent, psychologically, ethically, and politically. And I dare say for, that from the moment it took off among our ancestors, it must have been highly adaptive. In fact, I'd go so, to, so far as to suggest that this change in spiritual worldview marked a watershed in the evolution of our species, the point at which humans first began to treat other human beings as persons of equal status to themselves, independent, private, respectable, responsible, free-willed, low-key of phenomenal consciousness. Everyone else, a soul in good standing, the equal of ourselves. Now, I've last brought in that word souls, and should I, as a scientist, be using the term soul? Doesn't the term soul carry too much baggage? Well, it does carry a lot of baggage, and I think that's precisely why I, as a scientist, should be recognizing just how important it is. Um, Keith Ward, the theologian, wrote, the whole point of talking of the soul is to remind ourselves constantly that we transcend all the conditions of our material existence. We transcend them precisely in being indefinable, always more than can be seen or described, subjects of experience and action, unique and irreplaceable. In other words, exactly the kind of creatures which we discover ourselves to be uh, through the illusion of consciousness. So here's where I'm driving. I think that for members of the human species to live in a world where people in general have this opinion of themselves is to live, to live in a world that we can call the soul niche. And I mean niche now in the in conventional ecological use of the term, an environment to which a species is adapted um, and in which it's designed by nature to flourish. Trout live in rivers and gorillas live in forests and bed bugs live in beds and humans live in soul land. Soul land is a territory of the spirit. It's a place where the magical interiority of human minds makes itself felt on every side. A place where we naturally assume that every other human being lives as we do in the extended present of phenomenal consciousness. Where we recognize and celebrate the awesome possibilities of individual, private joy and suffering. It's a place where the fate of, of one's own soul and other people's souls is a constant talking point with the soul, where souls are the subject of gossip, of tender concern, of mean speculation, of manipulation by prayers and spells. It's a place where the claims of the spirit begin to rank as highly as the claims of the flesh, where we can join hands with others in sharing the beauties of the world which we, was, we ourselves have an enchanted. Well, I could go on in that vein, but I'm sure I don't need to because you live there in soul land. You know. And the consequence of all this was, well, the consequence is, I'd say, that human beings are set up by nature to dwell on those eternal questions. Where do we come from? What are we? Where are we going? Consciousness sets up the questions, but it also begins to answer them. And it's been in asking and answering these questions that our species, as a biological entity, has raised itself nearly to the level of the gods. 
Well, can we as anthropologists and archaeologists, for that matter, begin to guess when this development came about historically? No one's had any good, clear suggestions about it, and perhaps because they haven't thought about it, about it in quite these terms. But I do like to think that there are clues in archaeology, um, and I'll point you in the direction of one. In the village of Villafamish, it's in the Valencia region of Spain, there are some rock paintings in the cave just below the castle down there, um, which date to about 15,000 years ago. And when I visited the cave uh, a few years ago, I was taken aback to see the resemblance of one of these images on the wall of the, of the rock of the cave to a drawing I'd made earlier to illustrate the privatization of sensation. Uh, I made that drawing 10 years earlier, I may say. Um, now, of course, I can't help wondering, was this painting, in fact, an early Neolithic representation and celebration of what it means to have a self? Well. If that's so, let me take that bit of speculation a bit further. What about all those other spirals and cups and rings within rings, designs that seem to speak so strongly of interiority, that are, are a recurring theme of rock art wherever human beings have settled right across the world? America, Australia, even in Cambridge, England, one was discovered last year. Well, archaeologists have no, had no good theories of what su such symbols are about. It's, it's even been suggested that a multiple representation such as that one from Ireland, that there's some kind of field plans um, to map out the, 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 the geographical territory. Well, with due reservation, I think these are souls. I think these are soul plans mapping out the social territory. This is the Bronze Age version of this. Here, we might say, live souls. Well, I'm running out of time, but can I have another five minutes? Yeah. Um, uh, because I don't think I can leave the story there. Here, live souls. But surely we must say that in reality, uh, lived souls. Because what's certain is that the human beings who made those marks on the rock are here no longer. The marks on the rock persist, the individual human beings do not. Soul land, I have to say it, is dangerous territory. And perhaps you know the reasons. Perhaps you saw that eagle about to whisk this young one away. I showed you my son in the waves in Ireland. On the hillside above this beach, uh, in, in County Kerry are the graves of local people who must have played in those same waves a few hundred years before. You see the uh, Skellig Island in the background there. Well, one of those graves was open, and so I, I looked inside. The problem is that the higher you climb, the harder you fall. As the future of the individual self has acquired ever greater psychological significance in the course of human evolution, so the death of this self has surely become an ever greater tragedy. A tragedy to the one person who loved himself and a tragedy for the others who loved him too. This particular person has gone. The very person whose consciousness and intellect were designed by nature to believe himself a being of such singular importance. We can hardly underestimate the loss involved. The Russian poet, Yevtushenko said it for us. No people are uninteresting. Their fate is like the chronicle of planets. Nothing in them is not particular, and planet is dissimilar from planet. In any man who dies, there dies with him his first snow and kiss and fight. Not people die, but worlds die in them. The critic George Steiner has called death a scandal. Individual souls surely deserve better than to be snuffed out in less than a hundred years after their first arrival here on Earth. Now, I suppose it's true that if we can think like detached evolutionary scientists, we ought to be able to reconcile ourselves to death, at least theoretically. Because we'll recognize that this has, of course, always been nature's way 
individual survival has never been the main concern of biological evolution. What has mattered is the survival of genes and germlines. And in fact, evolutionary progress would come to a stop if individuals did live forever. And perhaps we don't actually have to be scientists to think like that. Non-scientists, too, can, of course, surely take comfort from the idea of cultural continuity. The thought that even if our individual selves can't survive, we can still have some sort of presence after death through the things we leave behind, especially through the lasting effects we've had on other people's lives. Well, maybe, I don't know about you, but Woody Allen one was having none of that. <laughs> I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to ach achieve immortality through not dying. <laughs> I don't want to live on in the hearts of my countrymen. I want to live on in my apartment. <laughs> 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 and in living on, wanting to live on in his apartment, also of course known as Woody Allen's body, um, Alan Sholley speaks the deepest language of the embodied human soul. There are no two ways about it. As conscious creatures, we've been selected, designed, to consider death the ultimate betrayal. So what's the way out, if there is one? Could consciousness itself provide a way out? Well, perhaps the fact that the human species is still here, that our, that our ancestors didn't find the prospect of death totally soul-destroying, if I can put it like that. Perhaps that's living proof that humans did, in fact, find a way out. And in fact, as I describe at some length in my book, it's about the last third of it, but I've no time to tell you about it now, I think consciousness did have one more trick up its sleeve. Nature gave us each a natural soul, a common or garden spiritual presence in this world. But in doing so, she paved the way for human culture to come up with the idea of a supernatural soul, an out-of-this-world soul a soul that goes on living in some fashion even after the body has turned to death. And so I think despite all, we can be sure that the individuals buried in those tombs above the beach, that they went to their deaths in the full expectation of being resurrected somewhere else. Well, perhaps that's not quite the solution Woody Allen was asking for. Um, but nonetheless, if you can't live on in Manhattan, you could do worse than to live on as an angel. <laughs>